There's so much data out there, right? Uh, and we're constantly, we're constantly being bombarded by it and trying to sift through it. Um, so we can make, we can make good decisions. So we can benefit from all of that data and also to try to figure out how to protect our privacy with it. Uh, data is just becoming a big part of everybody's daily life. Um, it's important for business. It's important for people. It's important for the environment too, because it gives us measures of how we're interacting with that system. I'm Barry Wilson. I'm a systems ecologist. And I stand at the intersection of three big systems, the environment, people, and the economies that we create. And data, data is an incredibly powerful connector between those three systems. Data helps us connect cause and effect. Um, and that's particularly true when we're looking at the cumulative effects of multiple overlapping human land uses natural disturbance like wildfire and avalanches, uncertainty like climate change. Data allows us to bring together all of those pieces of information and can try to connect the dots. That's really what it all boils down to is connection. Imagine, imagine a world where data was connecting us to our past and enabling us to create a better future because of that. Uh, imagine a world where all of this data that we have was connecting culture and races and organizations and nations in a way that we could collectively act for the benefit of the, the common good. And then through that action, open up opportunities to create prosperity for the individual. Imagine that. Imagine a world where having a good understanding of data helped us avoid unintended negative consequences, stuff we couldn't see coming. Imagine a world where having all of this data that we have helps us unlock prosperity while caring for the earth. Imagine how great that would be. So I want that. And that's why I created this show, CFX, The Connection of Things. Connection is the way we bring all that science and knowledge and data together in a way that's going to be useful to help us. And connection is also very important to our guest today, Ken Bannister. Ken is a panel roster at the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency. Ken is also president of Ken Bannister and Associates Consulting. And Ken chairs an advisory committee at uh, Mount Royal University, helping guide curriculum for students and connecting them to have the right skills with employers. So when they're coming out, their skill sets and employers are really well connected and aligned. So let's get started with the show. So we are streaming live. So if you're with us live, put your put your name in the comment or chat session. Um, if you want to ask a question for Ken or I during this show, just pop it in there, and we're going to uh, do our best to answer those questions. All right. So this is this is not just uh, um, Ken and I having a conversation. We want you in the conversation too. So welcome, Ken, to the show. Thank you, Barry. Thanks for having me on today. Yeah, how are you doing today? Life is great. Um, I've been able to get done a few things that I was had on my to-do list, like everybody, and uh, free up some time to come see we see you and and visit with your audience today. Awesome, fantastic. So uh, I'm streaming today from Sequatmagulu, which is the unceded territory of the Sequatm Nation in southern British Columbia. The city I live in is Salmon Arm, and Ken's joining us from. Calgary, Alberta, over on the other side of the Western Cordillera. And he's in uh, the traditional territory, the Blackfoot Nation, and uh, the home of the Métis Nation of Alberta. So, uh, Ken, 
this morning uh, we got our first snow. <laughs> And that's like way early this year. How's it going over there? Have you got snow too? We've had snow for a few days and uh, it's been slippery and sliding and people are starting to adjust. It's one of those things like we, you were talking about systems is people just have to start to learn. There's new things happening. They've got to adjust and we'll, we'll get through it. Yeah. So uh, they're going to have to uh, like get their winter tires on and stuff like that to adjust to the system. <laughs> Mine are scheduled for next week, unfortunately. <laughs> All right, so reminder, we're, we're uh, streaming live. Leave your comments and suggestions in the chat box there and, uh, and then because we want to engage with you. Now, we're going to talk about data. Ken knows a lot about data uh, in his experience in his professional career. Um, he's been very involved for many decades in the application of data towards good decision making. And so I'm really pleased to have Ken here uh, besides the fact he's a good friend of mine, um, really smart guy and sharing some of his knowledge with us today. Uh, Ken, is it data or data? However you want to say it, Barry, is I don't think there's a standard way. Just pick the way you want and, and use it. Okay. I like data. I don't know why. Isn't that... He's on the, he's on the TV show. Yeah, that was on Star Trek, wasn't it? Data? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, just, I don't know what it is. That's So that's what I'm going to say. Data. So Ken, how would you define, we've, we've talked a lot about data. How would you define data in, in the context of the complex systems that you and I are, seem to always be working in? You know, what is it? How do you, how do you break it down? Well, I want to go back a little bit first, Barry, is I started out in chemistry. And so chemistry is one of those hard, hard physical sciences. And everything you do in chemistry revolves around data. So that's where I was first trained in data. So what I look at is data. It's information that's collected through sources, various sources, to indicate the nature or the state or the condition of something or a system or um, just a place and time even. It's often numerical information, such as text, observations, um, numbers you've collected from some sort of a, a sample, but it can also be something else. It can be a, um, a story. It can be um, an understanding. It can be a kind of a different type of thing that scientists wouldn't normally consider yeah. to be data. Right, because um, we're always thinking about measurement and, and exactly. stuff like that. Yeah, and, and so starting out in the sciences is that's what you're trained in. As you get out into the work world, and, and I eventually ended up doing a whole lot of policy work, you start to learn that people's stories and their observations um, are part of the data set. And it's a very valuable part of this, the data set. Data represents something. It can be a physical thing like the sciences talk about, but it can also be a state of mind. Um, it can also be about a place, a time, a condition. And so one of the ways I like to think about this is if you go into a movie theater and you wanna go see the, the latest and greatest and you walk in right at the start and maybe you see um, a grand scene and then you walk out of the, the movie theater and five minutes later, you walk back in and you see a train going down a track and then you walk out and then you walk back in a few minutes later and you see an airplane taking off is, can you tell me what that, that movie is about? Well, maybe, but maybe not. And that's what, what we're, we're confronted with when we look for data is whether it's physical data like chemistry sampling or whether it's stories, it's we'd see a part of a representation of something that's bigger. Right, right. And um, so that that's a nice way of describing it. And it's also uh, to me, you know, we've actually been talking about this just yesterday. I was uh, talking with Ryan McDonald, a hydrologist to talk about uh, sampling for uh, water quality. And one of the big problems is that, you know, like periodic uh, individual 
samples, spot samples here and there. Uh, really problematic because the system, well, it's, it's, it's a good pun actually, it's very fluid. And so it's changing all of the time. And so if you're going to actually be measuring something like water quality, spot samples don't really do it for you. What you need to have is some kind of continuous monitoring going on. That's right. And there's a, an old, old, old saying. It says, no man steps in a river twice, the same river twice. <laughs> it's because the man is different when he steps in yeah. and the river is different. Yeah, that's cool. That's pretty deep, deep thoughts <laughs> by Ken. So I want to talk a little bit about some data, though. Is okay. As we we're moving into this is there's really kind of three big pools of data. There's the structured data. And so that's the stuff that I was trained as, as a chemist and then as a, an ecologist. It's the air, the water, the land information. And it comes from, as you said, grab samples or continuous monitoring or surveys or experiments. But it can also come from observations from experiments. Um, it could be something like geospatial data. We're, we're starting to move into a whole lot of things like LIDAR and um, uh, geotagging, geolocating right. various things, whether it's uh, your phone tells you where you are when you're driving yeah. or whatever. Right. Then there's unstructured data. So the unstructured data is text heavy information. It's the kind of stuff that we used to see in all the reports. It's what we would find in a lot of older technical reports is it's descriptions of things. Um, could be historical information. It's probably non-digitized. And so you have to find a way to, to bring that in. Along with un, uh, along in the unstructured data is there's testimonial information. Yeah. So things like interviews. Um, if you're going to go interview a person in a social science methodology is you might collect that information um, digitally on a recording, um, but then what do you do with it? You can't put it into, into a table like you would, you know, the, the sodium, uh, calcium, magnesium type of data in water chemistry. Right. Also case studies is um, when you do a case study and, and business analysts do a lot of case studies is they'll do a study looking at a whole bunch of assumptions to come up with a resolution. Again, there will be data in that, but the resolution generally is something that's textual or contextual. Um, so, an example of unstructured data that you'll see in the regulatory world in particular is a testimony at a hearing, perhaps from a First Nation elder. They won't have specific hard and fast facts of, well, I had this conversation with this person on this date at this time, right. but they'll tell stories and they'll use anecdotes and they'll, they'll talk about a lot of the things that might have happened as they were growing up. So that's some unstructured data that has to be captured. And then the last part of data I want to talk about is metadata. And metadata ends up being data about data. And so if you're doing something, writing something, capturing something, is there's a lot of data collected around that data. And I'll get back to the, the physical mm. sciences again. So data about and, data. Yeah, I go out and I might collect a water sample. Okay, so now I need to know a whole bunch of data about that water sample. Right. Where did I collect it? What was the temperature of the water? What was the time of day? Did I preserve it correctly? Right. Did I do my proper quality control, quality assurance techs um, in collecting it, bringing it to a laboratory? And so that's all the data, the metadata that's collected around information. So um, that's a lot like, um, well, what's been a lot of controversy around Facebook. Well, and, and Facebook is a prime example in that, uh, you know, when you go onto Facebook or actually any social media site or a lot of sites is they're collecting information such as what site did you visit? Where, right. um, where did you click on the page? Is how long did you spend on that link? And that is all information they can then compile and use to sell to advertisers or for other uses. 
There's um, a couple of good books out there right now about what data is and how it's being collected and how it's being used. Yeah. There used to be a saying that went, if you didn't pay for an application, you were the product. Well, <laughs> that's that's since changed. And now it's not, you're not the product, you're the mine. And so they're mining your data to right. sell to advertisers because what they're doing is they're selling your attention. And also, I mean, it, it's it's interesting not to go too deep on this, but um, they don't necessarily, it, there's a lot of value in that metadata uh, if we're thinking about social media, especially in just knowing the trends. So you don't have to know the individual, but you want to know what's the trending activity, right? I guess that's really what we're doing with the testing too in, in COVID as a good example is understanding, you know, what, what are the trends? I mean, obviously there's the physical tracking of the individual, but overall when we're talking about, you know, flattening the curve, that's, that's Definitely. the, that's the description of, the activity of a whole pile of people. Definitely. And, and it happens all the time is, you know, the United States is in the middle of an election campaign right. and there's polls all the time. And so that's looking for trend data. Um, right. The COVID situation is the provinces are looking for trend data. So that's more a use of the data than a collection of the data. Okay. I see. So, you know, in, in collecting data, um, I mean, one of the things that's really important if, if you're approaching this from a cumulative effects land use perspective, because we were getting a little bit out there on social media, but uh, it, I guess this applies in, in any aspect. You really have to understand uh, what's the objective of the data that you're collecting. And then how are you going to make sure, how are you going to assure the quality, right? Right. And so generally what you do, and, and I'll, again, I'll go back to the, the natural resources, is you have data quality objectives. So you set out through the, the your sampling program is how are you going to ensure that you've got some proper representative data? So you want to set up data quality objectives. So an example of that might be I'm going to go back to that river and do I rinse my container or not? Do I just take a sample? Do I fill that uh, sample jar up to the top or do I leave an airspace? And so all of that is part of your data quality objectives, which then leads into your quality assurance and quality control. And so an ex getting back to that example is you might do something like a trip blank. And so you take an exactly similar bottle filled with distilled deionized water out to the field, never open it and bring it back. You might do another one you take out to the field, open it to the air and bring it back. And that's just to see if there's various influences that aren't being accounted for when I dip my water bottle in the river and then bring it back to a lab for analysis. Right. Okay. Well, um, it's getting a little heavy. So <laughs> I'm going to flip over to uh, a segment called the, the Forest of Whispering Speakers. So I'm just going to cue the music intro for that. Okay. I don't know if I'm going to stay with that intro music, but uh, you know what? It's copyright free. <laughs> and uh, this is actually something I started in the initial segments. I was starting to, well, this whole segment is, is inspired by my favorite musician, uh, Gord Downey, the late Gord Downey. It was the front man for the Tragically Hip, my favorite band, uh, Canadian epic rock band. And, um, Gord's an unbelievable poet and lyricist, and I just find so much meaning in there. And I thought, you know, actually, a scientist, we can learn a lot from artists Definitely. Uh, by their uh, insights into the world. And so I often um, try to go deep into the lyrics and find the messages that they're giving us. Uh, Forest of Whispering Speakers comes from a song uh, 
called uh, It's a Good Life If You Don't Weaken by the Tragically Hip. And it really speaks to the point that I think they were trying to say is that, you know, you need to be able to grow. You need to be able to let go of your preconceived notions. Uh, that's how we move forward. So you just might have to weaken a little bit on <laughs> on your piece. And um, so, yeah. And, and so I was using, I was playing little clips of songs but uh, getting into some issues with copyright. And even though I'm trying to, I'm actually promoting and advertising somebody else's product, um, I guess the copyright world doesn't see it that way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna switch up on this and just talk about the lyrics because that's something I can do without having uh, that issue. Hmm. So, uh, and then I'll still include the links to the artist and the musician underneath the show. So if you wanna go listen to the song and hear it, as, as the uh, artist expressed it, uh, you can do that. So th this week, uh, the song that I brought up, and I've got a little graphic here. Where did I put it? There it is. It's uh, by a guy called Thomas Dolby. Back oh. in the 80s, you remember him? Uh, she Blinded Me With Science. That song was a pretty uh -huh. big, big song. And... Um, so, you know, I was thinking about that and I actually, I was reading this blog by a, a group called insightsquared.com and they're a data and analytics company that um, they, they take data and uh, move it into intelligence. And then they're actually doing some pioneering work on artificial intelligence. So I'm giving them a really nice plug here, but uh, I got this idea from reading one of their blog posts. And so I wanted to share <laughs> share that and so they were talking about this they were a little geeky on data and music as well and so they were talking about that song she blinded me with science what sort of science did she blind you with it says on their blog that's right data science the term she blinded me with science is referring to a colloquial british expression that means deliberately confusing someone by giving the impression of highly complex knowledge <laughs> and uh, man, oh man, you know, can uh, we see this all the time with data? We can be blinded by all that data and sorting it out, sorting out that data so that it's not confusing. If you can do it, it's really powerful. And like one of the techniques that I work with is visualization and, and really distilling down big tables uh, of data into something that's easier to understand. And you could visualize that. Um, using things like 3D or animation, which we do in our land use planning. Uh, but you could also use somebody's imagination to visualize it in story, right? And I Definitely. thought it was really interesting that, um, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, Thomas Dolby was actually the music director for the TED conference series up until 2012. I did not know that. Yeah, so he actually had this, I think he had this science thing going on there. <laughs> well, that reminds me of Brian May from Queen. Okay, tell me about that. A lot of that. people don't know that he's got a doctorate in astrophysics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's uh, you know, we can learn a lot from musicians. We, there's that whole left brain, right brain thing, right? Definitely. And uh, different ways of knowing, different ways of perceiving, uh, lots of good insights in there. So uh, that was the forest of whispering speakers not as inspiring as if i was able to play thomas dolby you're just have to gonna go on to your itunes or spotify or whatever and, and have a listen for yourself uh, so that i don't get in trouble with the copywriter but we do have another exciting segment right now it's time for ken's rapid fire questions perfect and every guest looks forward to this with great anticipation <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the idea here is quick question, just sort of off the cuff. What's your response? Okay. You yes, ready? No. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Favorite food, Ken? Uh, pasta. Pasta. Favorite drink? Uh, beer. Ah. Um, boxers? They go together, you know. Pasta With beer. Pasta and beer. Yeah. No, uh, pasta I like beer. I like pizza and beer. Pasta um, beer. Okay, the the boxers or briefs? Briefs. Okay. 
<laughs> Not going down that path. Uh, Ken's a golfer. Uh, Titleist or Callaway? Ooh, Callaway. And what's your best golf game score? My best score is yeah. about an 82. That's pretty good. It's pretty good. And the thing I know about that is you're an honest guy. <laughs> so I'm can... a data collector, so I collect the proper data. <laughs> and we can count on that number because there's a lot of sandbaggers out there. <laughs> All right. Uh, one of your mentors and something really valuable that they taught you that you could share. Hmm. Um, there's a number of them. The one I'll pick out is one that few people would have ever heard of. Is She was one of my professors when I did my master's degree. And she's, um, I think she's since retired, is she is one of the few people that really taught complex adaptive systems or complex dynamic systems. Her name is Pila Brunel, and she did her doctoral work under a fellow named um, Buzz Holling, ah, yes. who was a systems ecologist at UBC in the University of Florida. And so Pila brought all of this, this learning and information and insight into um, the classroom. And I really thrived on what she was teaching. Awesome. Okay. Um, that was a long rapid fire answer. <laughs> okay. You ready? Let's pick up the speed here a little bit. Uh, sea bass or sea dogs? Sea dogs. All right. And what are the sea dogs? Quick. The sea dogs are a bunch of uh, fellows that I've known for some of them for decades where we um, meet on occasion and talk about cumulative effects assessment. Really exciting stuff. My, uh, my wife calls it nerd pizza. <laughs> and I have had the distinct pleasure of eating beer and pizza with the sea dogs uh, on a couple of occasions. It's, it's awesome. Um, I just keep my mouth shut and listen. All right, so you said beer. Uh, you must have known question seven was coming. Pilsner, lager, or ale? Blogger. Okay. Didn't take him long to answer that one, did it? All right. And our last question, what single piece of advice would you give someone thinking about a career in systems thinking? Um, do it. Do it. Awesome. All right. That was a good short one. That made up for the other ones. Okay. Okay. So let's, let's move back into data. Uh, let's talk about like, so the, we, we've talked about kinds of data, what the heck it is. Um, let's talk about how we uh, manage it, store it, uh, who owns it, who gets to own it, um, and access it, and that kind of thing. Oh, that's a that's a big, interesting, deep talk topic. Is uh, one of the the big issues around data is who owns data. If I, as a scientist, go out and collect it and it's information that I have physically created, that is my data. If it's a story told to me from somebody else, is that my data or is that their data? I'd say and their so, data. And so it becomes one of these grayer areas in mm. that um, if it's their data and they're lending it to me, are there restrictions around that data? Yeah, And so it gets back to some of these things about um, the bigger picture. If you're in on Facebook and you're clicking around, is that your data or is that Facebook's data? And so we haven't as a society resolved these things yet. I think they're gray areas. I think there will, there's probably people would fall into two different camps, uh, maybe uh, at the big end of the polls, one is it's totally mine and I'm lending it to you. And the other is, um, well, you told it to me, so I have a, an authorized use of it. So mm. it's one of these areas that I think we still have to figure out. Yeah. And, you know, I think part of the answer too comes to uh, relationship. And so uh, like when somebody shares information with me, um, like when you tell me something, when, if I share that to somebody else, I'm going to say, well, Ken told me that, right? So I'm at least going to acknowledge, um, the person who taught it to me. Uh, when I, 
if I'm gifted with knowledge from indigenous knowledge keepers, I don't ever share it unless uh, I've asked them specifically if I can and they've given me permission. And, and part of that, it, it's not only the fact that um, that knowledge was a gift to me and, that, and, and it's that I owe the respect of asking whether or not it's mine to share. But I've also realized that um, when knowledge is shared between people, uh, it connect, it, a connection is created. And um, usually that knowledge holders not telling everything they know. They're giving enough that they figure the person receiving it can accept that, right? So, so let's, let's talk about that in three contexts. Okay. Um, one of the things that uh, I have done is I've taught university courses at Mount Royal University in Calgary. Yeah. In that is when you're in the academic world, if you publish a paper, if you um, make an article of some kind, you reference your sources. And yes. so there's a couple of different ways of you can do that. Um, but generally, you you attribute information to whoever the original creator was. Like when you share yeah. a photo on a blog, you put who took the photo. Well, you should, but you don't always. Yeah. Then you get to the regulatory world where I spent a long time. I spent almost 30 years in the regulatory world is in something like a hearing is a testimony or information from a report or tables or whatever would be put on the public record. Yeah. And so then it might still be owned by the, the individual, um, but it's open to the public to be tested, particularly right. if you're using it for decision making. And then there's the real world is when we're talking to people, we often don't remember where we got the information. And so it's difficult to attribute who we got it from. Right. There are specific places where you might say, you know, as you did is uh, perhaps an elder gifted me with this information, yeah. but think about it. Uh, so much of what you know, you only know tacitly because you've been told by somebody else. Yeah. And so there's actually um, a blurge a, a growing area where this is starting to be kind of frothing up. I'm just starting to see it in, in information sources. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, that's a big piece. So um, I think we, you know, let going from the stage of who, you know, like part of what you were talking about there with the hearing, I was just thinking about that in the testimony. It's, it's the context in which the data is acquired is, is highly relevant. So all of those examples that you were giving were sort of different situations and so like when you're at a um, environmental impact hearing it's clear that you're speaking on the record for something to be recorded whereas it, it may be different in a, in a conversation you know the data that we're creating right now streaming online uh, is intended to be shared with lots of people and we hope uh -huh. that they will share it so All right so it's funny how that's kind of implied but yet I'm running into this problem with the copyright. I can't share my favorite band's music without getting in trouble. Right, and and because we're live streaming, is this <laughs> our intellectual property or is it somebody else's intellectual yeah. property? I don't know. I'm, this, these are issues that a world of data are starting to bring out. Yeah. It gets to be some of the questions that have been asked over the last five to 10 years uh, as governments take data and put it into open data systems. Yeah. And so one of the things we've seen is people worldwide have been saying, we need more transparency. So what governments have been doing is they've been opening up their data sources, making old reports that might've been behind firewalls available, um, making access easier through open data portals. But we're still, as I said, working around some of the rules with this. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to circle back to that piece uh, right near the end of the show, but I want to move into, um, the, the, the last sort of separate segment, which is the CFX library, and then we're, we're, we're going to come around on how we use data. So the CFX library is another segment that uh, I sort of imagined in sharing because a lot, a lot of times in the work that I do in cumulative effects, I'm always searching for information. Um, and it's, I, occasionally, uh, 
I don't have to just go to Google or to a library, but I can actually uh, get a lead from somebody else. And I really appreciate that. So I thought it'd be good to be sharing that kind of information uh, through this show because we have such a, a varied number of guests. So um, I'm going to start with you, Ken, uh, on a recommendation of a, another source of data that people could go to freely <laughs> uh, to get more information about complex systems and, and data. Uh, well, so I follow a lot of sites. Um, I can't give you exact names without looking up because I've got, I've got them bookmarked. But one of the things I've been trying to do personally is, as I mentioned, I taught at Mount Royal for almost a decade. And every year I'd have students come up to me and say, well, what books do you read? Where do you get this information from? How do you compile it? Uh, because my course was a discussion course. It wasn't, uh, I don't think I ever had an exam in my course. It was all about discussion. And if you were part of the discussion, you ended up with an A in, in the class. Wow. So with that, that's where the learning was. It was in understanding what other people's points of view were. But the instructor has to seed that. So at the end of this, I started to think, well, there's got to be a way to build this and share this. And then at the same time, I've also, for probably 15 years, um, mentored younger staff at the various organizations I've been at. And inevitably, I would be asked, how the hell do you know this stuff? Well, and, and one of the things is, I'm a reader. I read incessantly. And so to share all of this based on these promptings, I've started to develop a, a, my own blog and I've called it the Complexity Project. And why the Complexity Project? That's kind of a strange name. The reason I've called it that is I believe we live in a complex adaptive or complex dynamic system. And so where you and I will talk today, it's going out on the web live through YouTube, is we're gonna spark something with somebody. And so our one and one and adding a third doesn't just become three, it might become five because you've got emergent properties coming out. And that was the kind of the learnings from the, the mentor I mentioned earlier right. is Pila was really good at allowing you to discover how you live in a complex adaptive, a complex dynamic world. So with that, I've started to write a number of blog posts on various things. One of them has been on data. Yeah. Um, I, I'm big on critical thinking. I will be writing one on wicked problems. And wicked problems are, are those problems that are so big that you only get one chance to really try to solve. Or there are problems that are composed of other types of problems. Is a number of cities have had had programs to end homelessness. And they're going to do it within a certain period of time. Well, ending homelessness is not one problem. It's probably about five problems that you've right. got to start to tackle. There's addiction problems. There's family problems. There's mental health problems. Um, there's the problems of infrastructure, whether it's having enough infrastructure or, or, or too much infrastructure. So you've got to start to solve all those problems before you can solve the problem of homelessness. Right. Okay. So we're going to put, uh, I, I, I've read, I read Ken's blog. Uh, we're going to put the link to it down there so you can read from it too. And he has a number of great sources there. Uh, and that's going to do nothing but grow over time because I know Ken's been working at it. He's, it's uh, sort of just getting going in the last couple of years, but um, you know. Well, I started it in uh, well, it's like April, uh, okay. part of my pandemic planning. All right. Well, so it yeah, I was thinking it went a little bit longer than that, but um, it anyway. So it's going to continue to add to. So that's something you want to go there and subscribe to. You my my entry into the library, uh, you actually brought up one of the authors earlier, and that was Buzz Holling. And uh, you and I have both read this, this book called Panarchy by Holling and Gunderson. And uh, I will put a link down below, but uh, that's an amazing book. It's, um, I won't lie, it's about this thick and it's pretty heavy, like it's a lot of theory. 
But um, if you can work your way through that, uh, unbelievably clear thinking about systems, how they regenerate, how they shift from state to state, uh, what that means for resilience. So if any of that you're interested in, um, Panarchy by uh, Holling and Gunderson, excellent reference. Mm -hmm. That's, um, I, I'd like to say a favorite book, but as you say, it's a, a pretty dense text. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, Big Minds wrote that one. All right. So we're, we're just into the last section of today's interview here, Ken. And, um, you know, we, we've talked lots about this piece before. Um, and just like personally, uh, I'm a, I've kind of been annoying to my wife, Karen, oftentimes when I go shopping because I like to do research. <laughs> and so I like to, first of all, understand if I'm going to go buy something, you know, like what, what are the key priorities of it for me? I mean, it's a, it's a little crazy. I used to be spontaneous, but I found that I got what I wanted more often when I went sort of through this approach. And so what I do is I do, I do research and try to figure out what's important to me. I figure out my budget and then I go looking for it instead of just waltzing into a store and seeing what's available. So uh, Ken, tell us a story about using data like that in that sort of same way uh, to buy a truck. Well, th thank you for that prompt. Is This is actually one of my, my other favorite topics I like to talk about, which is decision-making. Yeah. And so now what you're doing is you're taking data and using it in a real world situation. So as Barry knows, he's seen me do this presentation is how to use data in decision-making is really um, a refinement and an interpretation of data. So let's say you want to buy a truck. There are numerous trucks on the market that you could buy. And so what I like to do is as Barry has indicated, I'm kind of, technically oriented like him is I'll, I'll do a bunch of research. I'll find out a bunch of things. I might look at engine size. I might look at payload size. I might look at the number of seats that are in the truck. Is it three seats, six seats? Do I want a, uh, you know, an extended cab? Um, I might look at the number of cup holders. That might be important to me. What about color? make um, trim level. I can get a basic truck or I can get the super fancy rodeo edition. Um, <laughs> uh, I can get the maybe a type of transmission and so on. I mean, there's, there's so many things you can look at. So how are you going to use all this data I've collected to make a decision? And so the, the easiest way I have found is to take all that information and basically put it in a matrix. And so you can use a spreadsheet, you can do it on paper, you can do whatever, is take all those criteria, engine size, color, make, model, trim level, um, all those various factors and put it in a single column. And then compare all of those factors against the various trucks. So you might have a Chev truck in the next column, yeah. a Ford truck, a GMC, a Honda, a Toyota. Right. And so you can use this basic matrix to fill out this information. And you might say, okay, well, the GMC truck was red, the Honda truck was white, and the Toyota was gray. Um, and then fill in all this information. And then you can start to compare trucks in what's called a paired wise comparison. Is I will start by looking at the first two trucks, and then I'll look at all the criteria. And I will say, what are these criteria and how do these trucks compare? And so I'm only looking at two trucks at any one time. And maybe one's got a bigger engine, one's got a smaller engine, and I'm gonna be, well, I need a bigger engine. So that takes out the one with a smaller engine. So I've picked a winner out of those two trucks. And then what I do is I take the next truck and I look and say, okay, well, it's got the same size engine. So that becomes a wash. What is the next important thing to me? Well, it might be payload size. One can carry two tons, one can carry a ton and a half. Well, I don't need two tons, but a ton and a half, well, that's, that's kind of overkill too, but it's just lesser than that. Right. And so maybe that truck now wins. And so what you can do is you can step through 
all of your various trucks and come out with a reasonable choice. It might not be the best choice it, because quite frankly, we're humans, we're influenced by strange things. Right. Is maybe color was the absolute most critical thing to you at the end of the day and you didn't realize it. Or what if and your so, dad always bought Fords? Well, exactly, that might be it. <laughs> I am. Um, I'll, I'll use a, an, another little anecdote with this. Is <laughs> I got these glasses about a year ago, and I walked into the optometrist, and I tried on about four pair of glasses, and I took them up, and and the lady who was helping me said, um, "Well, how did you decide so fast?" And I said, "Well, I knew basically what I wanted. There's not a lot of things with glasses. Is I looked at do they fit the shape of my face." Can I get the lenses I want? Um, what color do they come in? And how soon can I get them? And from those three pairs of four pairs of glasses, I went, this is the one and got them ordered. Well, there you go. There you go. So, so it's a matrix approach, being able to go in and sift through all of the data points. Um, you could even be ranking them. It's kind of a systematic approach. And then I think uh, most of us, when it comes to something like a vehicle, then there's also passion and there's uh, some other, you know, which, which, you know, style and all of these things. And, and those might be other factors that use it. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. And, and but you've taken a rational approach. You've taken a rational approach to sifting through the big pile of numbers. Yeah, exactly. And so it is one way of doing it. There's there's lots and lots and lots yeah. of other ways. It's one that I've found that is effective and it's relatively quick. It can also be used with stakeholder groups is yeah. because you can get stakeholder groups together and say, okay, well, walk them through the scenario of buying a truck and then walk them through what they're looking at to make decisions on. Yeah. So once they've got the paradigm of, of how to use this, they can start to say, what are the things that are important to us? And if you're out in a rural area um, trying to look at perhaps a regulatory hearing on various things. You can walk through this and say, okay, well, you know, is land use important to you? Um, if all of this happens, what is the cumulative effect of this? this does this put us over a threshold? Right. And so you can then take this simple analogy of a truck and start to use it for building bigger things, understanding bigger concerns and help people through making decisions on where they'd like to see things happen. Yeah, that's a great segue. And then, and then the ultimate th part of it is, are they willing to put their money at that place? Right, right, which is in effect, you know, in your work with regulators, um, in the in the bigger picture, that's what you have to do. You have to sift through unbelievable amounts of data and information that are brought forward, um, see how they stack up against a set of objectives and targets, risks, uncertainty, and, and then make a decision to go forward. So I really encourage you, everybody, to check out Ken's blog for sure uh, and uh, follow him. He's also sharing a lot of good stuff on LinkedIn. And... Um, with that, Ken, I think we're going to start to bring the close the the show to a, a close. I want to also invite people to the upcoming uh, CFX conference series. Uh, CFX twenty twenty live is happening November eighteenth. It's a virtual event. Uh, it's global. We'll be brought. We'll be streaming live from uh, Paris, New York. Uh, I think we're got, we're confirmed now for California and destinations all across Canada, Toronto for sure, Calgary, uh, Saskatoon, little old salmon arm down here uh, in Sukhumak Ulu. Um, it's a global event, bringing in world-class speakers, uh, all on looking at cumulative effects, understanding what those big drivers are of, of those systems. Ken is gonna be moderating the data panel. Uh, that was a good choice, right? Because he's a really strong <laughs> data guy. And uh, we've got some amazing panelists that are gonna be on there talking about open data uh, in the United States and in Canada specifically, and where people can get access to that and then and connecting with those organizations because yeah, more and more and more, we're getting access to this information that we really uh, want and need to have. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is that, uh, you know, 
Conferences can be expensive, but this one isn't. Uh, at $297, it's a steal of a deal for the level of expertise you're going to get access to. When you sign up, you get instant access to the last two years, all of the recorded presenters. So kind of unbelievable value uh, if you're interested in cumulative effects. If I was you, I'd be taking that deal. So cfxconference.com, go check it out. You can see all of the speakers and, and get registered. Um, if I can put in a little bit of a plug on that. Yeah. Is uh, Barry and I have both spoken at other cumulative effects conferences. And I have found what Barry's been doing to be one of the better conferences. It's oh. much, much more relaxed. Um, he brings in different types of people. It's not all focused about the hard scientific data. There's a lot of the unstructured data that gets talked about. Well, thanks, Ken. Yeah, we're, we're trying to bridge that gap. We're, as scientists, we're really good at counting and measuring and especially on the environmental side, but uh, geopolitical forces around energy, uh, social, economic aspects, just as important in land use planning. So we're, we're trying to bring that perspective. And let's face it, when we're talking about cumulative effects, especially when we're thinking about things like climate change, it's a global, those are global systems. So we need global perspectives. So that's why we're, we're going in that direction. And uh, one thing about virtual, it allows you to access people all over the planet um, a lot easier than used to be where, you know, the only way to do that was to fly everybody <laughs> into a place. So uh, just as we close out, uh, I'd like you to subscribe to this show. If you hung around this long, you are loving it. And so hit subscribe and hit the little bell. And the reason you want to do that is because it takes away the work for you. Now you don't have to check. You'll get a, a, a notice when new show comes up and you'll never miss out. And, and I want you to do that because we want to get some live Q&A going here so that the conversation reaches beyond uh, just uh, the guests and myself, but with everybody else. If you didn't catch a show live, you can still leave your comments, suggestions, ideas, questions underneath, and Ken and I will be sure to get back to you. All right, so Ken, thanks very much, my good friend. Uh, as always, it's great to spend time with you. Um, I look forward to getting past uh, the pandemic so that we can um, have some good beer. I'll be having an ale. Thank you. And, <laughs> and pizza. Okay. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, Barry. Thanks very <laughs> much for having me today. Okay. Talk soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.